Welcome back to Plague Size Studios, everyone. Ryan here. Welcome to potentially the last AX8 tutorial I ever make because we're going to take elements of all the other walkthroughs, all the other tutorials, the work I've done with scenes and integrating with tube amplifiers and uh, using other outboard gear and throw that all into this video, but we're going to automate it through MIDI. And this is a powerful tool that I've been waiting to talk about because I was actually working on the video that should have gone up prior to this a few days ago, which is a, an original song playthrough. And I want, wanted to save it because I, I use this exact technique in that playthrough. Um, and what that does is allow me to use the fractal platform as my main tone engine, you know, most like the, the cabinet emulations, the chorus, the delay reverbs, all that's coming from there. Um, a lot of the times the amplifier sound was coming from there. But for like my rhythm sound, I wanted to use one of my Mesa heads and I wanted to be able to control, you know, changing the channels on it and doing that kind of stuff without having to play the pedal dance. So this exact trick has been implemented by bands for years and years and years now that play to backing tracks or click tracks live. And if you're going to go through that trouble of routing those signals anyway, it doesn't take that much more work to throw on a couple MIDI automation tracks. Uh, to you know basically avoid having to switch on and off multiple different pieces of gear at the same time of course you have to have gear that is midi compatible but the axfx ax8 fm3 all that stuff is out of the box now word of caution um, first of all everything i'm showing will be applicable to the axfx2 which is good um, there, there are a couple minor differences since you have more amp blocks and other stuff like that but everything i'm showing you here is basically copy pasteable across um, those two SKUs. But when it comes to the AxeFX3 and pre presumably the FM3, there are some differences in workflow since you have channels instead of XY switching. Um, there, there's some different programmable options and still the workflow is, is more or less the same, but you'll, you'll have to check your manual to see exactly what continuous controllers um, you know, talk to what part of the FM3 or AxeFX3. So, you know, the, the idea remains the same no matter which fractal piece of gear you're using, but just keep in mind that if I pull up a, a particular value, it may not correspond exactly. But let's say if you do buy the FM3, this tutorial will still be a good place to start, I think. Another point of consideration for practicality is this does make a bit more sense when it comes to using a rack mount processor as you'll have kind of all of your gear there anyway if you're using in-ears you'll have your wireless units there if you're using wireless guitar units you got like a mixer some sort of routing system dedicated backing track player usually a laptop then you know you can have all that stuff in one space whereas with this you know if you're using a floorboard you'll have to have a 20 30 foot midi cable uh, who knows but it, it still very much makes sense for me the way I'm using it. And it, at least that gives you a backup option if something does go wrong. Um, I would still recommend having a foot controller for like an AxeFX3 because, you know, if something walks out with MIDI and it's known to do it, uh, especially in the worst of times, and at, at the very least you can still have your scenes assignable, all, all the, the stuff you need um, within the, the click of a switch, which is good. But um, yeah, there is something to be said for form factor here, but you know, plenty of people will still want to do this, whether it's in a rehearsal space or you're, you know, just jamming at home and you don't want to have to, you know, fight a pedal board all the time. Totally understandable. So with that, let's jump into my live playthrough session and I'll show you exactly how I automated the preset scene and even amp channel switching through the AX8. Before we jump down the software rabbit hole, you first have to determine how you want to connect your AX8 or AxeFX product to your PC or Mac. And for a vast majority of you that are especially just getting started with this MIDI automation thing, I would definitely recommend sticking with the USB connection. You're probably already using that to program your processor using AxeEdit anyway, and you do indeed have the ability to communicate over MIDI with that connection. It also lets you bypass any other audio interfaces you might have, though you may want to use that as kind of your master MIDI unit if you're communicating with other gear. But for the sake of just getting started, I would definitely say just stick with the USB. And if you feel you need to expand your capabilities later down the road, you can always do so with another interface or a more capable expansion card. Now, the second very important thing is to make sure whatever presets, whatever scenes, whatever tones you want out of your device, that they are done right now. 
because once we start opening up and manipulating the MIDI parameters, using AxeEdit is really going to be a pain in the ass. In fact, it's it's really not possible uh, on the AX8 and AxeFX2 Gen products. I'm under the impression that the AxeFX3 and even the FM3 handle multiple inputs at the same time, such as you know if you're editing on the AX2 or AX8, and then you go to the physical unit and switch scenes, then you know your axe edit instance will pause and it'll kind of freak out. Um, so you might not run into that big of a problem if you're using third generation hardware, but I would still recommend if you're going to make any tweaks, do it on the hardware itself and close out anything else that could potentially interfere with your MIDI connection. Chrome, Google Chrome, the browser is very well known to cause issues as well. Um, sometimes it will lock out Axe Edit entirely because it does take control of many devices without really asking to. So I would recommend have everything else closed out while you're working on this the first time around. So with your device plugged in and powered on, let's finally get into the software side of things. I'm going to be demonstrating this using Cubase 9.5 on Windows 10. So depending on you know your audio workstation program of choice and your operating system, your mileage is definitely going to vary but you should still be able to follow along see the, the same basic steps and then you know you can consult other uh, tutorials and manuals that kind of stuff for your specific use case but it will generally follow like this now the first thing i'm going to do i already have this set up so i'm just going to show you how you would do this the first time we're going to go to studio setup in cubase and under midi we're going to make sure we have our midi port active and I do. So this actually shows up as AX8 MIDI. If you're using AxeFX2, presumably it'll show up as that. And this is what it says over the USB connection. Now, if you're using another interface, say if I, if I was using my Focusrite Scarlet 6i6 to send the MIDI commands, then this is the one I would want to make sure is active as well. But um, for now, we're just going to use the USB connection. Then we're going to go over here and add a MIDI track. And since this is actually the only real MIDI track I'm using in this whole project, the rest of these are instruments, then this will automatically default to channel one. And that works for me. Um, if for whatever reason you're using more complicated setups, say you're using like a, an instance of contact that uses multiple channels, then you'll have to find one that's, that's empty. But otherwise, I have everything set to channel one. The uh, AX8 and any Axe effects should be ready to accept that channel. Um, so for the sake of simplicity, I would advise you use that as well. Then we'll create a MIDI track, throw that on, and we'll go in and edit it. Now the first kind of quality of life thing that I do is actually add separate notes every time that I want something to change. So for instance, I'm going to put a C1 across the bottom here. I know I'm going to be using the same preset. And then at measure 17, I want it to change. Of course, I have it moved back just a tad here. We'll explain why in a moment. But it, it's measure 17, I want to switch from a clean sound to my rhythm sound. So I'll add another note. It could be whatever note you want. And I'll stretch it across until I want it to change again. And over here, this will be like a lead sound. This will be an, a, another kind of rhythm thing. And so on and so forth. Now, the AX8 or any AxeFX product does not give a damn about what note data you have here. This is entirely for visual reference, and I do this. That way I can quickly go back to you know whatever change there is instead of having to remember, okay, I have one at, at you know channel 17 or at uh, measure 17, so let's scroll down and try to find that. Um, and if you want to get real fancy, you know you could move these, change colors, do different octaves, different notes, whatever, for each one of your scenes. But that's kind of what I start out with. That way I can quickly go to whatever um, expression change that I need. So like a lot of MIDI-based products, the AxeFX family doesn't care about what notes or velocities it's receiving. It cares about really two things. First of all, program changes, and second, continuous controllers. And these are the controller lanes we have down here. Now, if you pull up a standard MIDI uh, key editor window that looks like this in Cubase, you're really only gonna start with velocity. But you can click down here, you can actually create additional controller lanes. And you see, I've got another instance of velocity. We won't want that. The controller you do want will depend on what you're actually trying to manipulate on your AX8, AxeFX, or FM3. And yours might look a bit different to this because I actually had to add a lot of these controller values. So um, 34 and I believe even 36 was not available initially. So at least on Cubase and uh, on a lot of different programs, you might have to go into a setup menu 
and drag and drop the ones that you want. So if 34 is over here, you'll want to click on it and move it over. I'm going to move over a different one just for example. Hit OK. And then now controller 38 should show up as such. So I'm going to remove this lane since I actually don't need it. I'm actually going to remove velocity as well. Now the first set of extremely important parameters are program change, which I have here. And CC0, which I have here, which is marked as bank select in Cubase. Combining these two numbers tells the AX8 or AxeFX to change to a particular preset. However, as you probably know, the products work in a, a bank configuration. So you have eight presets per bank, and then you have, at least on the AX8, up to 64 banks, which gives you 64 times eight presets. So basically, you use these two in conjunction as kind of like XY coordinates to tell the AxeFX or AX8 where to go. So if you assign CC0 to a value of zero and you give a value of zero for program change, it will actually take your device to bank one, preset one, which is the first preset on the AX8 or AxeFX. However, if you change, say, your program change to the number eight, without changing CC0, so we have a coordinate of 0, 8, that will take you to bank 2, preset 1, which is kind of like the ninth preset in total. Um, and that's kind of how that works. So basically, you go through 128 values on program change, 0 through 127, then you move on to the next round of 128 by moving up 1. So if we go to 1-1, one -one, that will take you to the 17th bank, preset 2. Now, in my case, I never left banks 49 through 64, which means I didn't have to change the CC0 value, and it's very likely you won't either. So I just stuck with changing the program value, and I pretty much hid this immediately. Um, but these are the two numbers that determine your preset. So as you'll see, I go along here, and then it takes me to the 17th measure, and this value changes to a value of 1, which changes the preset for me. So, um, and this is why I do this whole MIDI note thing, because you can scroll down and see exactly when the change occurs. Now, depending on which device you're using, you're going to want to move this change before the measure drops. And depending on what product you're using is going to determine how far back that is. So um, I actually have this a little before the fourth count on the 16th measure to allow me to have the full sound ready to go when the 17th measure hits. Um, and this is a bigger deal when you're switching presets entirely. This is why I like to work within one preset for one song. I simply couldn't do it for this song. I had too much stuff going on. Um, but you'll want to play around with this timing. So uh, a lot of the times, depending on your tempo, one count is usually enough. Sometimes if you're loading several delays and reverbs and amp models like I am, then you might have to move it further back. This isn't as big of a deal on the third generation products, like I said. But if you're on X, you know, 2 and you're switching presets, you're likely going to, you know, kind of see a similar thing. So let's go on down to the 86th measure of the song. You'll see I have nothing change on program change or CC0, so I'm still on the same preset. But what does change is this value of 34, and CC34 determines what scene you're on. Now, you'll see here, I go to a value of 10, but there's not 10 scenes in a preset, there's only 8. So this is one of those things where it resets every eight numbers. So zero through seven is scenes one through eight, but also eight through 15 is also one through eight, as well as 16 through 23. So it repeats itself. Um, so I could have just as easily set this to a value of two instead of 10. There's no rhyme or reason other than it's easier to see. That's pretty much the only reason I, I put it that far. So whichever value you choose, this will communicate with your Axe product in some way. It's going to change scenes. Just remember it repeats itself every eight values. And I like to use eight through 15. It makes more sense to me than starting at zero. There's nothing wrong with using any of these numbers though. It's whatever you're most comfortable with. Now there's a funny thing with this scene controller in that if you go back here, you'll see the first scene I start on is scene two, which is a value of nine on this preset. But once I change presets, I actually want to go to scene one but I don't actually have a CC34 to tell it to go to scene one. And that's because when you change presets, by default, it does go to scene one. I, I think you can actually change that in global settings somewhere, but I always set up my patches where you know scene one's the main one anyway. 
Um, so you don't explicitly have to tell it to change scenes if you're changing a preset and you want it to go to scene one. But if you are changing a preset and want to go to like scene three, then you do. Uh, but that's, I don't really advise, you know, that kind of practice anyways, you're going to add any, even more switching time. Now there's an interesting thing over here as well with the way I've set this scene up. You'll notice I do have the change right on the dot on 86 instead of, you know, waiting further back. The reason that is because I'm actually switching between a real amplifier in the effects loop and an amp model. So this would be kind of like using two amp blocks on an Axe FX2 and then switching one on and off. That way you avoid any kind of delay. Uh, my effects and everything actually makes it to where there's virtually no dropout. If there is, it's like five milliseconds and you can't actually tell. So um, that is one of the things you will have to consider is just battling dropout and how precise you want the change to be. So I could have stood to move this further back, but as it is, it's pretty much fine. As we go up and down the song, you'll notice I changed scenes a number of times um, on that same high gain preset. I actually changed back to my low gain preset on the uh, second preset of that bank. I go back to high gain and then I finish out the song with kind of a lead on another, another scene. Um, but this is really the bread and butter of automating your axe effects or automating really any kind of amp modeler multi effects unit that, that works in this way. Presets and scenes for that reason are extremely powerful, and that's why I advocate for setting up proper scenes because this will allow you to do so much, you know, have so many tones packed within one avenue, especially if you combine it with, you know, controllers and switches in the same way that I showed in a previous tutorial. And you can, by the way, on the AX8, automate that kind of stuff with MIDI as well. So if you go to other CC settings, uh, let's say you want to have a looper play at some point, that would be CC number 29. You just turn it on or off. Or you want to um, change the XY block without changing anything else on your amp, or change the amp block through XY without changing anything else. There's a, a particular um, CC setting for that. Now, all that stuff changes when you get to Axe Effects 3 and FM3 because they work through channels. So the specific CC settings do change there, but just you know, look at your manual, determine which ones you need to use, and otherwise it works pretty similarly. But for the most part, I say stick to scenes, stick to presets, um, you know, use those kind of scene controller things, and, and it will kind of work out without having to touch basically anything else. Now, there is one more controller I use, and this is CC11, and this decreases the volume. So in this instance, I wanted to decrease the output volume um, to kind of mask some changes when I was switching presets here. Um, and this is CC11, so this is your out volume. You can do the same thing with the effects send volume if you'd like. Um, I don't know if there's an effects return. I believe it's just the effects send volume. Um, and that would be CC12 instead. And you see I have it coming back up to uh, kind of my unity gain to play the clean part. But... Um, this, all these things, I think these three or these four rather is, is going to take care of 95% of people's needs. And as you see fit, you can always throw in some of these other things. Um, but again, if you work in this kind of, um, scene and preset logic, then this all takes care of itself in my opinion. And that's pretty much the extent of how I would program it. And if you watched the previous video, you'll have already seen and heard this in action, but just for a good measure, let's show a couple clips of that playthrough and I'll cut back to here, show you what the MIDI track is doing and how it's affecting the sound. So that pretty much does it. In a nutshell, once you connect your Fractal product in whichever way you see fit, make sure it's activated as a MIDI in and out device. Select that one in a MIDI track and then use you know, your program change, CC0 to select the preset, CC34 to select scenes, give yourself some time for the product to actually change. And then you've got other stuff like level and on or off switches that you can play with as well. 
And I think this is a valuable part of even stomp boxes or, um, you know, like floorboards and stuff that gets overlooked a lot of the times that might make a lot of working musicians' lives much easier, not having to worry about this kind of stuff. Because, again, if you're going through the trouble of backing tracks and click tracks anyway, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to be messing with the pedal board at that point. You know, if you do two changes a song, that's fine. But um, this eight-minute rock opera thing... <laughs> Uh, I was definitely not wanting to worry about changing sounds on the fly. Um, so this made it much more manageable. That about do it. Any other detailed questions, comments, please leave them down below. Um, again, I don't have a third gen product in front of me to answer all the questions with that, but the workflow should be pretty much the same. And um, yeah, I guess that'll do it for the AX8 saga for now. You'll definitely keep seeing it pop up, but I think, I think this pretty much completes what I wanted to show. So thanks for watching. We will see you next time. Bye.